Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. Hossein Shasavari, and today I'll be sharing with you on the lust of the flesh. All scriptures that I'm going to be using are from the authorised King James Version, which is the 1611, unless otherwise stated. So my introductory scripture will be 1 John 2.15 to 2.17, which reads, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world pass away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I think some of the things for me that stands out, it says, love not the world. The word world in the Greek there is cosmos, so it could be love not the world, love not the universe, if we translate it into today's um, language. Neither the things that are in the world. Because if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now this is a very interesting verse because it puts the great juxtaposition between God and the world, between God and Satan, between God and Mammon. God is putting a clear divide here. If we love something above God, then that's idolatry. The Bible says, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. It also tells us that um, we cannot have two masters because we'll either love one and hate the other or hate one and love the other. So God, he wants to be the primary. He wants to be the preemptive. He wants to be the number one. That's why he says, love the Lord your God. It's a commandment. When they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, said, love the Lord your God. So we need to love God. We cannot let anything supersede the love of God in our life. So it says, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a very harsh statement. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. The lust of the flesh is not of the Father. Even though some things feel good, it doesn't mean that those things are good. Not all things are profitable for us. And it says that the world passes away and the lust that also is going to pass away. But he that does the will of God abides forever. We're talking about eternity here. Not just our temporal time on earth, but the time after earth. As Christians, we believe in something that comes after our mortal bodies died. So I'm going to talk about lust. And the Greek word for lust is epithemia, which is a desire, a craving... A longing for what is forbidden. Who is it forbidden by? Well, what we're talking about is forbidden by God. I want to start off with a story from the Bible, from Genesis chapter 25, verse 29. It's the story of um, Jacob and Esau. So I'll start from Genesis chapter 25. And it says, And Jacob sod pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with some of that red pottage, for I'm faint. Therefore his name was called Edom, because in the Hebrew it's probably Edom. So they called him after this. Um, and Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. In those days, um, the birthright was for the person that was born first. So they would get the lion's share of the heritage. And Jacob he was the second twin. When he was born, he was born with his hand on Esau. Esau was born um, first, and it was, should be Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Now, there was a prophecy from God to his, his mother saying that Jacob was going to be the one that inherited. But it doesn't mean necessarily that God chose Jacob. You see, Esau made the choice to sell his birthright, and we will we'll see the story here. So Jacob in verse 31 said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? 
I want to focus on that sentence, what profit shall this birthright do to me? Sometimes we can be in situations where we think there's no future, there's no hope, there's nothing left to cling on for, let me just give everything up. We cannot do that. We cannot. This story reminds me of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God, who, when he was tempted by the devil for 40 days and for 40 nights, he, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, first of all. Some people think that when, um, when they're led by God somewhere, that there will be no trials or tribulations, but that's not necessarily the case. The Bible says that the testing of our faith will produce patience, and when patience has its perfect work, we will be complete, whole, lacking nothing. So Jesus was led into the wilderness, and it says, and he was hungry. Some people say, oh, it is Jesus, he, he, he didn't feel things of the flesh. But it says very, caref um, very um, specifically that Jesus was hungry. We see here in the Old Testament that Esau was hungry, so we have a parallel. Esau was a man of the flesh. Jesus was a man filled with the Spirit of God. And he resisted the devil, he resisted temptation, and re he resisted using the word of God. Because when the devil said to him, turn that bread into stone, you've got to understand he was hungry. And he may have thought, mm, I feel like turning this bread into stone. But Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When we get back to Esau, he says, what profit does this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, to, said swear to me this day. And he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. I want to say that nowhere in the Bible does God condemn Jacob for this action. Nowhere. God never calls Jacob a thief because he never stole. Then Jacob gave Esau the bread and the pottage of lentils and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau despised his birthright. That's a harsh word, despise. But when God speaks about Esau, it's not really nice. Some of the stuff that I've read that God talking about Esau, I've wondered, how, how can a loving God say these things? But God is loving and is merciful and is just. And it's the just part of God that we have to watch out for because we cannot continue to live in sin and think that God is going to bless us. We cannot continue to abide in iniquity and think that God is going to celebrate with us. We cannot continue to transgress the law or to walk off the path of righteousness, the, the, the way which is narrow, and believe that God is going to allow us to enter into the kingdom of God. Because God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of a man that he should repent. When God says that he's going to do something, he does it. God never lies. And so when we look at the word of God, it said, Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau sold his, his birthright, the, the generations, the blessing of God for lentil soup. Now we can look at this and we can laugh. Say, I would never sell my soul for soup. I think there was an artist, he said that he sold his soul to the devil for a happy meal. People sell their souls for so much less than food. And you can say, in what way? Well, we'll look at what the Bible says and we can see how people can despise their birthright. People can despise the anointing. People can despise the gift of God that is on them. People can sell short the anointing of God on their life by willfully sinning. So what did God think about this? In Malachi chapter 1 verse 2, he says, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet he's saying, wherein has thy loved us? He says, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Well, yes, he was his twin brother, says the Lord. Yet I love Jacob and I hated Esau. I had to think to myself, God said that he hated Esau, but you know what? We are in the New Testament now. We are under grace. And that's our Old Testament scripture. So we have to see, 
Is this repeated in the New Testament for us to believe that God can hate someone that sells their birthright? Unfortunately, it is. In Romans chapter 9, verse 13, it says, It is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. The Greek word for that is miseo, which means despise, hate, loathe, push away. It makes me uncomfortable to think about God hating me. Because the Bible tells me, yet when um, I was a sinner, he loved me. And so it would take a lot, I guess, for God to hate me. Well, I hope it would. I don't want to be selling my birthright. I don't want to be selling my soul. I don't want to be getting no mark of the beast. I don't want to fall out of the will of God. And I'm sure you don't either. So what, what could I do to fall out of the will of God? What could I do to, to, to err from God? You know, if we don't know that we're sinning, there's um, a word for that called missing the mark. But if we know that we're sinning, if we plan to sin, if we live in sin, if we sin so much that sin becomes a lifestyle, then what then? I remember um, as a teenager, I had a, someone that I knew and they were a drug addict. And I was talking to my, my dad and his friends and I was saying that this person told me that they don't take drugs anymore. They looked at me and they laughed and they said, <laughs> we always know to believe the word of a drug addict. Unfortunately, there are some sins that take over a person to the point that is generally not the person that you deal with, but the sin. I, I don't want to be in that case where I start to negotiate the word of God and say, you know, other people do it so it's okay because I'm defending the sin. Rather, let me humble myself and exalt God and say, well, what does God's word say? When we look into the mirror of God's word, we will see who we truly are. We'll either love it or hate it. In Romans 1.24, it said, Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanliness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their body between themselves. God gave them up. God gave them up to dishonor themselves through the lusts of their own hearts. It's not that God gave them the lust, the lust was in their own heart. We have to be careful what we think about. We have to be careful what we look at. We have to be careful what we meditate on. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But what you allow into your heart is gonna reside in there. In James chapter one, verse 13, it says, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. God cannot be tempted with evil. Wow. Neither tempteth he any man. God is not the one that's tempting you. So what does it say? In verse 14 it continues. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It says in verse 15. Then when lust has conceived it brings forth sin. And when it's finished it brings forth death. Sin leads to death. Just like at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they knew that when they eat it, they would surely die. The thing is that people think that because God doesn't strike them down dead straight away, that God is not going to do it. But God is a just God. And he's given us time to repent. He's given us time to run back into his bosom because he loves us. When lust has conceived, it gives me to the, the image of a person being pregnant, pregnant with sin. They've conceived sin. And even though sin doesn't manifest straight away, the fruit of sin doesn't manifest straight away, it takes time. So when a person conceives a natural, you don't even see it. You don't see it for maybe a month, two months, three months, and then they start to, you know, get the, the sickness, the morning sickness, the, the, the mood changes, um, you know, the appetite change, the, the sometimes women start to want to decorate the house and that can cost a lot of money. But give it a few months and you'll see that baby. Give it a few months and you'll see that when you allow sin to conceive, when you meditate on it, it will bear fruit. Now we don't want that type of fruit in our life. So we pray crop failure on that. But this leads us to problems with the lust of the flesh. 
In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking in their own lust. A scoffer is a person who kind of like takes the mick. They, they look down on whatever you say. You, you know a scoffer. They're kind of prideful, boastful, arrogant, conceited. And they walk after their own lust. People that sometimes I think of, um, for example, a man that will go around and just ruin people just for the sake of it. It reminds me of Psalm 1 when it says, Blessed is he who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. But I, I don't want to digress too, too much. In Proverbs chapter 22 verse 10, it says, um, I think this is the New King James Version, Cast out the scoffer and contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. Well, what does that mean? Cast out the scoffer. Now, the Hebrew word for that is lutz. You can see lutz. You know the people that they make their face like that? Lutz. Cast out the scoffer and madam, heated disagreements, will leave. Yes, dane, judgment, and kalom, shame, will cease. When you cast out the scoffer, heated disagreements will leave, judgment will leave, and shame will cease. I think, I, I, I don't like arguing. I, I, I don't like arguing. If I don't have to argue, why argue? Let's live in peace. God wants us to choose um, holiness over lust. He does. In Leviticus um, 11, 44, it says, For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify purify, cleanse yourselves, and ye shall be holy. I shall be holy, in Jesus' name. Ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Wow. We're called by his name. We're made in his image. We're ambassadors of God on this earth. And he's expecting us to be holy as he is holy. He's not expecting us to be sinners. He saved us from sin. He goes on to say, Neither shall ye defile yourself with any manner of creeping things that creeps on the earth. And in verse 45 he says again, For I am the Lord that brings you out of the land of Egypt. He's the one that brings us out of the world. He redeems us from the world. With an outstretched hand and a mighty hand, he redeems us. He's paid a ransom for us. The ransom was the blood of Jesus. And he says that he's done it to be our God. Therefore, ye shall therefore be holy for I am holy. Again, I thank God that that's Old Testament. Because being holy is very difficult. It's not something that I can do in my own strength. And, you know, we're in the grace. Oh, wait. First Peter 1.16 Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. It's been reconfirmed in the New Testament. And it does come up a bit in the Old Testament to be holy as well. God is expecting us to be holy. There's no way out of this because when God says something, he means it. The Bible says that, you know, when something repeats over and over again, that's doctrine. That's important. So does God have any instructions for lust of the flesh? Well, it has instructions for if someone else is committing lust of the flesh. So what does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9? I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, Wow. Fornicators. I mean, the Greek word for fornicate is pornos, where we get the word pornography from. So you could say a fornicator is somebody that engages in pornography. Pornography is also a major cause for divorce in marriages. A lot of marriage people that get divorced have said that um, the problem started when they start, um, started watching pornography and engaged in pornography. And if pornography has a stronghold in your life, in Jesus' name, you can overcome it. Even just right now, just say, Father God, I'm making a decision that I'm not going to engage in pornography anymore. I'm making a decision that I'm going to serve you. We, we have to be careful what we meditate on. Again, what we think we become. So, he says, I wrote to you... No in an epistle, not to company with fornicators. This is very hard. Don't even company with them. In verse 10, it continues, Yet not altogether with fornicators of, the, of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. 
for then you must needs go out of the world. But I've written to you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, a Christian, a brethren, the people that you go to church with, the people that call themselves Christians and, you know, sometimes don't go to church, it's their choice. But if anyone is called a brother and be a fornicator or covetous, you know those people that green eye, red eye, green eye, jealous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. It's funny how these things come in sixes. With such one, do not eat. But wait, didn't Jesus sit down and eat with, um, with um, sinners so much so that they called him a wine dipper? They weren't believers. This is talking specifically about believers. If someone is a believer, God expects a different standard of them. St. Paul the Apostle quotes the Greek um, poet Menander um, in 1 Corinthians 15.33. It says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. I really think this is a powerful verse because in the name of God version, it says, don't let anyone deceive you. Associating with bad people will ruin decent people. One bad apple ruins the bunch. In fact, let me go on to say in the Amplified Bible, the classic edition, it says, do not be so deceived and misled. Evil companionships, communion, associations, corrupt and deprave good manners and morals and character. I could stop here, but just because I'm going to do the Living Bible version as well. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by those who say such things. If you listen to them, you will start acting like them. God is interested in you, in me. He's also interested in the company we keep. And he's, he's stated it in the Bible, be careful who you hang around with. Remember Psalm 1. In Titus chapter 2 verse 11, it says, For the grace of God brings salvation that has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldliness, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. When I think of godly, I think of holiness. It says denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We're supposed to deny them. It doesn't say that we're not going to have them. But when we do have them, we should say, hang on a minute. No, I'm going to exercise control over this body. I'm going to exercise control over the flesh. I'm going to have dominion over my body. And I'm choosing not to do the things that I may want to do, but I know that I shouldn't do. Why shouldn't I do it? Because I love God. And God has says that he doesn't like it. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.22, 2.22.2, he says, flee also youthful lusts. Flee. I think of Joseph when Potiphar's wife came to him, lying naked in front of him. Beautiful woman, powerful woman. Knowing the consequences of rejecting her, he still did it and endured jail. In Egypt, back in the day, no human rights. When slavery was around. And still endured jail rather than commit sexual immorality with her. Because he did not want to sin against God. What a mighty man of God. Flee also useful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, which we translate as love, peace, peace as in wholeness, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Righteousness, faith, charity, Peace, pure heart. That's five, the number of grace. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Sometimes people come to you and say, did God really say? So did Lucifer, Satan, the devil, the serpent, who speaks with a forked tongue. He started off by questioning God's word. When you know what God's word says, why do you need to negotiate with people? People that want to terrorize your soul. People that want to lead you down the path of destruction. Why would we even listen to them? We know what God's word said. So why are we going to change our minds? Our minds are set on the word of God. 
In fact, in Galatians chapter 5 verse 16, it says this, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, that's good for me. I don't want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And it says that I need to walk in the Spirit. But it then goes on to say, For the flesh lust against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Hmm. Flesh, Spirit, enemies. Well, that makes sense. Nice and simple. It says that if we are led by the Spirit, we're not under the law. But the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, that's the pornography again. Um, probably masturbation as well. Uncleansiness, lasciviousness, idolatry, putting things above God. Witchcraft, that's like horoscopes. Hatred, variance. Emulations. Emulations is trying to outdo people, I believe. Wrath, which is like anger. Um, strife. Seditions. Heresies. You know, sometimes I've seen a lot of times where parents cause strife with their children just for the sake of it. I don't know if it's a power trip or something. But if you're one of those parents, remember this. The Bible tells us parents, don't provoke our children. Envians, verse 21. Murders. Way. Drunkenness. Revelings, revelings, isn't that like partying? And such of the like, oh my gosh, such like, it just keeps on carrying on. Of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I need to inherit that. I don't want to be like Esau and sell my inheritance. for lentil soup. It carries on in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Sounds good so far. Long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Ah. Okay, so the Bible's telling us what we have to do. We have to crucify the flesh and we have to crucify the lusts. I guess that means crucify the lust of the flesh. Sounds about right. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If anyone's telling you that they're Spirit filled, if you're a person that believes in glossalia, which is praying of tongues, then you believe that you're spirit filled. If you are saying that, according to Romans 8, that you're a son of God and the spirit cries out, Abba Father, and that's how you know it, bears witness with you that you're a child of the living God, then we need to be walking in the spirit. And if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the flesh. No, it doesn't say that. It says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. God is not confused, neither is he the author of confusion. So why exactly do we need to eliminate the lust of the flesh? Well, in Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to see God. I'm not living this whole life not to see God. I, I, I need to see God. I desire to see God. I love God. I want God in my life. I want more of God in my life. I want to feel him more. I want to see him more. I want to learn more. I want an exciting journey with him that every day is a new day. I don't know what's going to happen next, but it's so, so amazing. But we need to be pure in heart if we, if we want to see God. And to do that, we need to overcome the lust of the flesh. I'm not saying that you've got any problem with lust of the flesh, but if you do or you know someone that does, then you can um, share these things with them. You know, lust of the flesh is not something that you can stroke or touch and then it not come a part of you. In Proverbs chapter 6 verse 27, it says, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Well, no, it can't. So how do we deal with this? Because we can't do it in our own strength. Well, the first thing that we need is faith. And this may be my favourite verse in the Bible, I'm, I'm not sure, but definitely this one and the next one, I really love them, which is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
In the Living Bible, it says, what is faith? It is the confident assurance that something that we want is going to happen. It is the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we cannot see it up ahead. When I get in the car, I can't see church from my house, but I have a confidence assurance that I'm going to get there. And even when somebody else is driving, I can go to sleep and have a confidence assurance that I'm going to arrive at my destination. When I take a plane to go to another country, I have hope that I'm going to get there and have a confidence assurance that, you know, everything's going to be fine when I get there. There's so many things that I had faith for. I remember with my first child, I didn't know if the child was going to be born healthy or not. I certainly prayed and I, I didn't see her, even though after a few months I saw like some pictures. It wasn't until I had her in my hand that it became a reality. And so faith is seeing those things, believing those things that are going to happen. Now, even though I couldn't see um, my baby girl, I still prepared, you know, we, we got the room ready, we got a cot, we, we bought nappies, we got all these things ready in preparation for our baby. But I believed that God was going to deliver me a child. And praise God, I did. I had a beautiful girl, my first child. The same way in faith, when we believe in stuff, we have to prepare stuff for it. So if we're preparing to meet God, we need to prepare ourselves to holiness. We need to prepare ourselves to by eliminating some of these things which can stop us from getting into the kingdom of God. Things like the lust of the flesh. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, if we're going to really go to God and seek him out and say, you know what, God help me. It says it is impossible, but without faith it is impossible to please him. If you don't believe in God, don't bother coming to him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently. I prayed to God once and God never answered me. Really? Well, what do you expect? If you go to someone's house that you've never been to before and you knock on their door and you ask them for money, why should they give it to you? They don't know you. You don't know them. There's no relationship there. What exactly are you expecting? I'm living in England, I can't just not walk up to Buckingham Palace and say, Your Majesty, I'm one of your subjects, you need to help me out. No, I can't do that. I can't go to 10 down the street without an invitation and just walk there and knock on the door and say, Prime Minister, come and help me. I can't do that. There's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. And the truth of the matter is, the person in power sets the rules. Now there's no higher power than God. He is El Elyon. And he says that if you come to him, you must believe that he is and uh, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently. Diligently. Like a lifestyle. We need to know that um, with God, nothing shall be impossible. That's Luke 1 37. And that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Even if in the natural it may seem that we cannot cope with the lust of the flesh, that we cannot do it. If we follow God's word, then we'll be able to um, overcome it. However, some promises have conditions. You know, in Isaiah 55 verse 6, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Don't wait for God to depart from your life. Don't get to that point where you're so deep in sin that you cannot turn back. Don't allow yourself to, um, leave, um, to leave the presence of God. I think of the children of Israel in the wilderness when they were led by um, a, a cloud by day and a fire by night. And the Spirit of God may res reside in place for a certain period of time. But when it started to move, if they didn't move with God, there was no more manna. Because the manna was with the presence of God. If we want to be fed by God, we need to move with his presence. We need to seek him while he may be found. If you're out of God's will, run back to him. Run back. Don't let us get to the point where our heart, heart becomes so callous, so hard, that we cannot repent. That we're like, no... I believe in God. The devil believes. The demons believe. They tremble. But they're not going to heaven. Believing in God is not enough. We have to be righteous. And it's the blood of Jesus that makes us righteous. But even with the blood of Jesus making us righteous, we have to live in that righteousness. So while he is near, we need to call on him. The Bible carries on in verse 7 to say, let the wicked forsake his way. That means that we can't walk in the way that we choose, like, to live in the lust of the flesh and then to think that God is going to bless us for this. No, 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 no. The Bible says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. So it says, let the wicked man forsake 
his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let them return to the Lord. What's that mean? If we're thinking contrary to the word of God, we need to align our thoughts with the word of God. We align our thoughts by the, on the, by the word of God by meditating on it. It says, let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. There's only a few things that you can do that God won't forgive you of. Some people say, God will forgive you of anything. That's not necessarily true. He's not going to forgive you for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. He's not going to forgive you for taking the mark of the beast. And he's not going to forgive you for rejecting Jesus um, and then dying. So after you die, you can't repent. So those are a few things that I can think of off the top of my head that there's no repentance for. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, again, we go back to, um, to God because God loves us. It says, and have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as children? My son... Do not despise the ch thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou are rebuked by him. Maybe it's David speaking to his sons, but don't don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't don't despise getting told off. I can tell you something that my parents have told me of many, 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 many times in my life. Many times. In fact, I think the last time I was told off by my mom was probably yesterday for something. No, it was today. It was actually today. She managed. I only spoke to her for 10 minutes, but in those 10 minutes, I, I managed to get told off or something. But you know what? She tells me off because she loves me and she wants the best for me. My dad tells me off because he loves me and he wants the best for me. And I'm sure any parents out there, when you tell off your children, you don't tell off your children because you hate them or you despise them. You tell them off because you love them, because you want them to do better. You don't want them to hurt themselves. You don't want them to harm themselves. You want the best for them. The same way God wants the best for us. And he's seen the end from the beginning and the beginning for the end. He knows everything that's in our past. He's mapped out our lives. So he says, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, chasteneth, and scourge every son whom we receive. And if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons, not as servants, as sons. See, when you get chastised by God, when you get told off by God, when, when God starts to correct you, that's when you inherit. For which son is he who the father chastises not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof are you partakers? How can you partake? Then ye are bastards and not sons. So that's Hebrews chapter 12 verse 8. The Bible. Not me, I'm just quoting. That's what he says. Bastards illegitimate, no inheritance. Furthermore, in verse 9, we have had fathers of our flesh which have corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of Spirits and live? It carries on in verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any man fail the grace of God. Hang on a minute, you can fail the grace of God? I don't even want to get into that. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble with you, and therefore many have been defiled. Lest there be any fornicator, again, or profane person. Wow, profane. As Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. I think God really doesn't like people that sell their birthrights for a small portion. I think God is expecting people to be long-sighted rather than short-sighted, to think of the future rather than the now, to be people that build up towards something rather than people that be one-hit wonders, um, that just satisfy themselves in the, in the current. Verse 16, I'll read it again. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat, for lentil soup, Sold his birthright. I'm not selling myself my birthright for a, a tin of soup. For you know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. When he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance. Hmm. He found no place of repentance. Though he sought it carefully with tears. So he tried to repent. He tried to get his birthright back. But it was too late. Don't put yourself in a position where your faith can't take you out of. Don't put yourself in a position where, um, you know, the Bible says, don't tempt the Lord your God. Don't put yourself in a position where you can lose your salvation. 
What is the point? We only live what? Maybe a hundred years if we're, if we're extremely fortunate. But eternity goes for eons and eons. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Humble yourself under the mighty, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. God cares for us. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Who resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40, it says, Search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. The, our, our brethren all over the world are going through the same things. There's nothing new under the sun. Don't think that you're the first person that's undertook some sort of temptation. There, there are many. Or even if it is unique to you, there will be some type of it that someone else has gone through. And God is able to keep you through it. Well, how, how do we overcome the lust of the flesh? Because it's one thing to listen to the word of God, but sometimes it may feel that no matter how much we pray, it's just, it's not there. Well, in Mark 9, 29, Jesus said unto them, this kind comes forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. Sometimes we have to fast. Sometimes we have to subject the flesh and say, no, the spirit is gonna dominate. No, the spirit is gonna be stronger. Fast and pray. When Daniel had a dream that he didn't know what the answer was, he fasted and prayed. When Jesus, before Jesus started his ministry, he fasted and prayed. In fact, so many times you see that people fast and pray and, and God moves. Even in the natural today, when an unbeliever goes on hunger strike, which they're fasting, and they're saying that they're not going to do anything until something changes, which they're praying. Even in the natural, it works. So if it works in the natural, how much more in the spiritual? So we have to fast, we can pray, and we ask the question, Psalm 119 verse 9 to 11, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. With my whole heart I have sought thee. Let me not wander from thy commandments. Hmm. With my whole heart I have sought thee. And then here's the key verse, verse 11. Thy word, your word, I have hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We have to meditate on the word of God. We have to read the word of God. We have to get it into our system. We have to eat it, regurgitate it like a cow. Digest it, eat it, regurgitate, digest. Eat the word, drink the word, bathe in the word, anoint ourselves in the word, smell like the words. We have to be in his presence because here's the truth. If you're not in God's presence, then where are you? We need to go into the Holy Spirit sauna. We need to sweat out the flesh in his holy fire. We need to be thinking like David in Psalm 51 verse 6 where he says, Behold, thou desire of truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you shall make to me wisdom. So what is in the hidden parts? We know what's in the hidden parts. It can be lust of the flesh, lust of the um, eyes, pride of life. It can be so many things. It says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Yes, whiter than snow. It says in Revelations chapter 7, 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We need to make our garments of praise, our garments of worship, white in the blood of the Lamb. It needs to be like Daz, spotless. You know, nothing can get your whites whiter than the blood of the Lamb. Nothing can make you holier than the blood of the Lamb. Nothing can make you righteous but the blood of the Lamb. God is going for nepotism. If you are a part of his family, you're not getting into the kingdom of God. And that's why we have to be adopted and that's why we've been grafted in. It's the blood of the Lamb that makes us that makes us pure again. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He died so that we could um, have a relationship with God. And have made us kings and priests unto God and the Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. We have a choice. Like it says in Deuteronomy 28. You know, we can either accept the blessings of God or the cursings. I, I, I choose the blessings. 
I, I really do because you know I just like good things in life I, I want to go to a good place I, I, I like I like the easy life um, easy in the sense of that I'd rather be with God than with the devil easy in the sense that you know God is real God is very very real and, and I, I choose to serve him so if, if we if we choose to serve God and he's asking us to hold in us, he's not going to ask us to do something that that is impossible for us. But he does ask us to do things which make us rely on him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a quick prayer. And if you want to pray with me, you're more than welcome. There's two prayers that I'd like to do. First of all is an invitation to know Jesus Christ. If you've heard this message and you don't know Jesus Christ or you've backslidden to the point where you're like, I, I need to reconnect with Christ. In fact, I can do together. Or you, you feel that the lust of the flesh has overcome you and, and you want to um, to break the power of Satan or break the power of your flesh over your life. Then pray with me. Father God, today I've heard your word. I've, I've listened to it. It's connected with me. And I believe in your word. I'm coming to you in faith knowing that even in the natural, I may not be able to do this, but with you, God, all things are possible. I can do all things for you who strengthen me. And I believe in you and that you will reward me through my faith in you, through my faith in your word, that when I pray to you, you're going to heal me, you're going to deliver me, you're going to wash me whiter than snow, all the, all the sin is going to be put in the great sea of forgetfulness, and we're going to reconnect, and you're going to strengthen me and help me so that I don't have to sin anymore. I'm going to meditate on the things which are good. I'm going to meditate on the things which are pure. I'm going to meditate on your word, Father God. I'm going to learn your word so that I don't sin against you. So when the devil tries to tempt me, I'm going to be like, no. I'm so conscious of God. I'm so conscious of the things of God, of Jehovah, of Yehoshua, that I, I'm not going to live for the sin. I'm not going to live for the world. I'm going to choose to hate the world and love God. Father God, I thank you for this in the mighty name of Jesus. I bless your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. If you'd like to um, hear any more messages from me, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel where the information is going to appear or to my Facebook. And if you even want to support me, you can do that on Patreon or Payaroo, something like that. But the information will appear. Thank you so much and God bless you.